Hey guys, got a bit of a special video for you today. Multiple people here at NCIX have been working on it since late last year. We're going to be talking about cooling your two main performance determining components, your CPU and your GPU. There are a plethora of air and water cooling options for both, but is there really that big of a difference between those options? Our very own NCIX Ivan, aka Crazy Russian, aka Stoydog, set out to answer that very question with some help from Yimmy, our expert PC construction expert guy. So, come along with us. It's gonna be a wild ride. <laughs> the year is 2017, in case you didn't know, and liquid cooling systems, whether they're the maintenance-free variety or higher-end custom-built ones, are more reliable and accessible than ever. And as such, more and more gaming PCs come with AIO or all-in-one cooling on the processor, with AIO cooled graphics cards also being available from a number of manufacturers. Now, for this video, we will be using the NCIX PC Impact Hydro system, which comes equipped with an AIO cooled CPU and graphics card in its stock configuration. But what we will be doing with it is testing four different classes of cooling setups. Number one, your typical mid to high-end gaming PC with a Corsair H60 all-in-one cooler on the CPU and a stock air-cooled Founders Edition GTX 1080. Number two, an AIO cooled PC with a Corsair H100, so a bit of a step up on the CPU, and an AIO cooler on the GTX 1080 as well. Number three, a system with the EK Waterblocks Predator expandable all-in-one cooler, which has the graphics card and the CPU on the same loop. And number four, full custom Turbo Hydro hardline loop as built by the NCIX PC certified techs, which is our final configuration that we've got on the table right now. Now the testing that we'll be running with these four configurations will be focused on measuring the temperature and performance through three different scenarios. Scenario number one, stressing the processor only by running Intel Burn Test, or IBT, version 2.54 by Agent God, in case you're curious. Number two, stressing the GPU only by running Unigen Valley at 2560 by 1440 at eight times AA and ultra settings. And number three, a composite test stressing both the CPU and the GPU by running IBT 2.54 with a six thread load and Unigen eight times AA 1440p at the same time. So basically one and two together. One, then two, then one and two together. All of our tests we're running are at stock speed, so no overclocking to allow for apples to apples comparisons. Now while we're doing this, it's important to keep in mind that Intel Burn Test puts an unrealistically high load on the CPU to the point that the Intel's stock heatsink cannot keep up. It'll hit the critical temperature threshold of 100 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature of boiling water, and will throttle to save its life. So our testing has shown that realistic gaming scenarios with multi-threaded games such as Battlefield 4 yield temperatures about 15 to 20 degrees Celsius lower than you would get in a extreme burn-in scenario. So without further ado, onto the testing. Stage one, so that's an AIO liquid-cooled CPU plus a standard air-cooled Founders Edition GTX 1080. As you can see, during the first CPU-only test using IBT, the processor hit upwards of a crispy 90 degrees centigrade. Again, keep in mind that we are using an extreme burn-in scenario. Typical gaming scenarios, temperatures would be way lower. And during the GPU-only load test, we can see the stock air-cooled card throttling all the way down to 1,708 megahertz due to thermal limits. Its effective core frequency also jitters up and down like crazy, as you can see on the graph. The composite test running a full load on the GPU and the CPU actually yielded similar results to to both the standalone tests. On to stage two. This is the default configuration of the NCIX PC Impact Hydro with a 240 millimeter Corsair H100 on the processor and a separate AIO cooled graphics card. Here we're using the MSI Seahawk 1080. These GPUs often also have small blower style fans to help with cooling even more. The stepping up to the H100 cooling on the processor dropped about 10 degrees Celsius from the CPU temperature versus the H60 from test one, while going AIO style on the GTX 1080 had much more drastic results. Not only did the card run at about 50 degrees Celsius under load, which is a temperature close to that of a reference GTX 1080 while it's idle, but it also ran at a steady 1911 megahertz for the duration of the testing. Now on the graph, you can see a number of little dips that look like thermal throttling, but according to the GPU-Z data, that throttling wasn't because of temperature. It was actually because of the card's default power limit, which is the only thing that prevented the card from actually boosting even higher. So basically that frequency is about the highest you can go without modding. 
And as a side note, AIO cooling for a GTX 1080 or 1070 is currently only available pre-installed on select partners' cards, like the MSI Seahawk or EVGA's hybrid cards. Corsair had liquid cooling adapters for NVIDIA's 9 series cards available, but not the 10 series. On to stage three. The next step up is the Predator Expandable AIO Cooler from EK Waterblocks. Now, what makes this unit unique is not only the enthusiast class subcomponents it's built from, but also the fact that the unit can be expanded to also cool a graphics card. In fact, EK offers quick disconnect versions of their Predator, which when paired with one of their many compatible pre-filled water blocks, makes water blocking your card way easier than draining the unit, cutting tubing to length, and then refilling it. Now, we ended up having to do that anyways, because those pre-filled water blocks ship with worst case scenario tubing, which means it's got a lot of extra length in case your chassis is enormous and the distance between your processor and the radiator is super long. We're using a mid-tower for all these tests and we didn't need the slack, so we ended up cutting the tubing anyways and we didn't get the quick disconnects. Now, as you can see, the Predator, when used to only cool the processor, does yield about the same results as the H100. This is because, according to Ivan anyways, the quality of thermal interface material used between the processor's core and the integrated heat spreader, aka the top metal surface of the processor, bottlenecks the heat transfer, which means that throwing a Predator at just your CPU might not be the best investment. However, let us see what happens when a GTX 1080 is spliced into the loop. Well, okay, looks like adding a 1080 to the 240 millimeter radiator pushes its overall dissipation limits, making the CPU temperature go up during the composite test, since one loop now has to deal with heat coming from both the CPU and GPU. Luckily, EK Waterblocks offers a push-pull kit for boosting the unit's dissipation capacity. So once we equipped a push-pull configuration in our test system, both the CPU and GPU temps dropped noticeably by about 10 degrees Celsius. As a result, the machine ran at about the same temperatures as the H100 plus AIO graphics card model. Huh. So you might ask yourself, why would you bother running a Predator setup at all if they perform about the same? And the answer is adaptability. There are only two to three video cards on the market, as we mentioned, which are AIO cooled, thus severely limiting your choices for an AIO card. A Predator setup, on the other hand, can cool just about any card on the market if you get the appropriate water block from EK. Another advantage of the Predator is the fact that it uses ZMT, or zero maintenance tubing, which basically eliminates coolant evaporation, meaning you won't have to periodically refill a reservoir. The Predator doesn't actually have a reservoir, so that cuts down the cost and makes the system safer to transport. Okay, time to wrap things up with stage four, a custom Turbo Hydro Hardline Loop, built by our very own Yimmy. His name's Jimmy, but we call him Yimmy. Not only does the loop look sick despite being built in a mid-tower, it is also buffed with the thickest radiators we could physically fit into the chassis to maximize heat dissipation capacity. Now, once again, even with the ridiculous amount of cooling being thrown at it, the CPU runs hot running until burn test due to how it's built, as we discussed earlier. But as you can see, the temperatures in this test are still the lowest of the bunch. Now, what are the takeaways from all of this testing? Well, running a typical AIO liquid cooler on your CPU and an air-cooled graphics card is the most cost-effective cooling setup, but it comes at the expense of sub-maximum performance by the GPU. An all AIO setup, on the other hand, with separate coolers on the GPU and CPU, but both liquid coolers, can get you some more performance, and it's simple to just buy a CPU cooler and one of the few pre-made liquid-cooled GPUs out there, provided you get the cash. But a modified Predator setup with your CPU and GPU cooled on the same loop gets you the same performance as separate AIO coolers, while also allowing you to swap in pretty much any card on the market. Plus, it needs no maintenance once built, which is an advantage it has over a fully custom loop, like the one in this NCI-XPC Turbo Hydro. Hardline systems like this are pretty much the ultimate way to cool your system and make it look super badass, but it comes at the cost of required maintenance and a substantial investment. Okay. That's it for this video, guys. I hope you liked it. It represents a lot of work and testing as we had to build, test, and tear down all four of the configurations we used. Let us know in the comments what you thought and click over here for our previous videos. Follow us on Twitter if you like. Our handles are right there. And don't forget to subscribe right here uh, for more videos like this from NCIX. And now I must go nap because this video was so long and I'm tired. Ciao.